Okay, welcome everyone to our last lecture in this year, but we will continue in January with further lectures, so the semester is not over. But this is the last lecture in 2021 in machine learning. And the topic we are talking today about is called causality. So that is one of my favorite topics and it's gaining more and more momentum also in the machine learning area. So when you look at the deep learning experts like Joshua Bengio and these kind of people, they have papers where the word causal is in the title. So I think that is a very important one, which is often missed in classical presentations of machine learning. Um, of course, I like it a lot. I also have a full lecture on it that goes through a whole semester. But um, here is a compressed version of some of the thoughts from it. Yeah? And maybe in particular, the ones that are related to machine learning. So to get started, so what is this causality thing all about? So let's say you have some data. So this is some classic slide that I think many of my colleagues are also using to introduce causality. So this is a, a, a scatter plot of different countries where on one axis we have the chocolate consumption in kilogram per year per person living there. And on the other one, we have the number of Nobel laureates. So the Nobel Prize winners also per 10 million population. And curiously, as it turns out, this is super correlated, those two numbers, okay? Wow, amazing. So here's a very simple recipe to become more like Switzerland. We just need to eat more chocolate, okay? And that would make us better scientists. I mean, that is so obvious, right? We are eating, I mean, I'm eating so much chocolate when I'm thinking, right? So it totally makes sense, right? So we just need to produce more chocolate. and. Of course, this is garbage, right? I mean, there's some other variable here, which is maybe um, how rich a country is and the richer countries, right? There's a, the, the, the population can afford to buy chocolate. And of course, the richer countries also put more money into research or they have better universities. And that's maybe why they, they have um, more Nobel laureates. Um, curiously, Germany eats a lot of chocolate and they are not so great with the Nobel laureates. So that's kind of curious. So. Anyway, so here's another one. So it's also a nice correlation. So this is the global average temperature versus the number of pirates that are out there. Okay, so the number of pirates here going down actually. Okay, so let's say we have approximately 17 pirates in 2000. I don't know where this number comes from, but like in the 18 and 1900s, we had like thousands of them. Okay, and it looks like the problem with global warming could be solved so simply. We just need more pirates. Okay. So we should invest in building ships and having these these black flags with with some some this this skull. Okay, so here's a, that, that's another one, right? And I will show you yet another one uh, in in a minute. So those are all strong correlations, right? Where then where it's kind of obvious that it's garbage, right? I mean, there's again some other variable which is like yeah industrialization right people having other jobs and all these things and that's maybe why there are also fewer pirates out there okay or maybe we have a better police or whatever the reason is but the reason of course is so the global warming is not caused by the pirates and the pirates are not caused by the global warming or the other way around so there's no direct connection between them so there are many more examples so i googled for them of course and i found a nice entry at stack exchange one of my favorite uh, websites on the internet so examples for teaching correlation does not mean causation. Okay, there's a whole stack exchange entry for this one. And there are some nice examples from Peter Flom. So the more firemen are sent to a fire, the more damage is done. Okay, so what should we conclude from that? So if there's a fire, send only one firewoman or one fireman, then the damage won't be so large. If you send too many firemen to a fire, the damage will be really large. Of course, this is also garbage. Nonetheless, it is true, this statement is true. So there is a strong correlation between the number of firemen and the, the, the amount of damage. But of course, the fire is large. So you send many firemen and then the damage will be also large. So again, there's another variable we are not talking about. And so we have this correspondence. Here's another one. Children who get tutored, so you get like extra lessons like from friends or whoever, they typically have worse grades than children who do not get tutored. That's also a curious one, right? So it looks like tutoring doesn't, is not useful at all, right? And here the, the key is, of course, children only get tutored when they have 
maybe worse grades. And that's why they, they are basically um, getting tutored to get better grades. And on average, nonetheless, they will still have worse grades possibly than people who didn't got tutored, right? So you see already in order here to measure the effect of tutoring, which we would expect, we would have to split the, num the children into different groups, right? We should split them into children that have big, good grades, not so good grades, and then very, very bad grades. And then we should do this analysis in order to find a causal effect from tutoring on um, the grades for each of these groups separately. And I'm sure you will find out that the children with bad grades, if you split those into two groups, the ones that get tutored and the ones that get not tutored, then the ones that get tutored, they will improve their grades. Actually, the thing that I just described with words, that is already a method in causality, how to get like the causal influence from one variable to the other. So you need a third variable and you create subgroups, okay? Here's another one in early elementary school years. The astrological sign is correlated with IQ. Wow, how about that? However, it weakens with age and disappears in adulthood. Curious, so what about this astrological sign? I thought this is all garbage, but looks like there's something in here about intelligence. Interesting. Um, of course, here's a simple explanation is that um, at the early elementary school times, the, the children are so small that a couple of months could make a big difference in their development. Okay, so maybe being half a year older or younger really could mean a lot to your current state of what you are capable of doing. And that's why then the astrological sign is correlated with IQ, which is then no surprise. Here's another one. I think that is not from the website, but that's another fun one. People play golf. Uh, when people play golf, they are more likely to be rich, right? So great, let's get some golf balls and let's start playing golf, right? So it's so simple, yeah? you just need the right sport. Actually, even there might be some truth in this, right? So if you play golf, you meet like some other important people, right? On the golf court and maybe that makes you even richer and you can do business. But of course, it's, it's kind of meaningless. So those are all examples um, that are obvious and that are fun, right? But if you look into the news, there are sometimes examples, what, for example, what is increasing or lowering the employment rate or what is increasing or lowering the, the tax that a, that a country gets. So there are many things that are seem plausible, right? And where you might also draw correlations and you draw lines and that are not as absurd as these stories here, but they that somehow could make sense. However, we always have to be careful that if we have correlation between two variables, it doesn't imply causa causation, right? Those are counter examples. And that means also for the ones that look very plausible, we should be very careful. So, and this is the topic basically. So this, these kind of things, it's actually the stuff that we are interested in. We really want to learn about causal relationships in nature and these kind of things. However, unfortunately, typically we talk about probabilities and I will show you very briefly on one of the slides that probabilities are just not enough to describe this kind of effects. Um, there are really nice books on these topics. So today we, we can only scratch the surface of this topic. And, but there's, there's a lot to say about it. And those are my two favorite books. So one is um, from Jonas Peters, Dominic Janzing and Bernhard Schulkopf. Those are former colleagues of mine. So I'm a bit biased of liking this book. Okay, so I really like it and it's a great book, but I must say I was a former colleague of them. Okay, nonetheless, one thing that is great about this book is that you can download the PDF for free, right? So you can download it for free, you can read it, you can look at it, and then you can buy the book when you're rich, okay, and play golf. So this is a nice book. It explains, basically, it starts at zero and it explains you everything and it has an interesting perspective because those people, they also know machine learning very well. So that might be your language. So they are computer scientists. Actually, I think Jonas Peters now is a professor for statistics. So he speaks both languages. Um, then there's another nice book from one of the pioneers. Julia Pearl is a computer scientist from, uh, I think, University of Southern California, USC, I think. Yeah, I think that's right. And so he got a Turing Award, which is like the Nobel Prize in computer science, and he got it for his work on causality. So he's like uh, maybe one of the famous persons here in this causality area in computer science. And um, he came up with a graphical way to think about causality. So we talked already about graphical models and 
one of the earliest book on graphical models, I think it's called probabilistic reasoning in intelligent system. Do I have it here? No, I don't have it here. But that's another book from Julia Pearl. So Julia Pearl is a pioneer in these Bayesian networks that we've seen earlier. And then later he moved on to thinking about how do these graphical models also, how can they express also causal, um, causal connections between variables. And so um, that kind of revolutionized the way we think about causality today. There are also other areas that are um, already have lots of method about causality. One is econometrics, so in, um, in economy. So they have methods and they are aware of these kind of things because in econometrics, you want to evaluate, for example, whether certain policies lead to higher unemployment rate or lower unemployment rate, or whether decisions in your company lead to like higher gains in your um, whatever, in your money that you make. And the other area are the social sciences. So the social sciences, they also have a long tradition already of thinking causally about stuff and about variables. And they are like different branches. And the Julia Pearl one is a computer scientist branch in a way. And I, for me, this is a grand unifying view that kind of can understand now many of the methods developed in econometrics and in social sciences. And having this graphical language of Bayesian networks allows us to understand many of the pitfalls that there are. And now, why do I like this book? This is a very thin book, okay? So this book is written, I think, for people from social sciences or people from economics. So it's just the right level for me to understand causality as well. So here, it's really, everything is really nicely and easily explained, the Pearl view on things. And also for this book, there are so-called previews available. So I think you can read part of the book online. I'm not sure whether maybe even all of the chapters are here. I haven't checked. But when you go to this website, you can legally also download like parts of the book, maybe even all of the chapters. I don't know how, how it is. Anyway, so I like both books a lot. So they are kind of written from slightly different perspectives. But um, if you read both of them, then you know more than I do. Okay, so great. So here are some more books. So the classic one is the, this bigger one on the left hand side, it changed color with the second edition, I think from red to green. So that's a book called Causality. And that's a big collection of the work of Julia Pearl in this area. So there are different chapters with different topics. Sometimes it feels a bit like it's there are also papers used for the different chapters. So sometimes some things are double in my sense. But nonetheless, for me, this is the reference if I really want to see who came first or who had the first insights and something. Then I look into this book. In particular, there are really nice chapters where Julia Pearl is discussing the methods from social scientists and from econometrics. So this is really like an, a very important book, but it's also a bit more tough than the previous one that I just showed you. Then, so as often there's the East Coast and the West Coast. So I think this is not the, the West Coast, but it's uh, the, the East Coast. This I think is Pittsburgh. So I think it's Carnegie Mellon University. So there's Peter Spurtis and Clark Glimer and Richard Chines. I think they are coming more from the philosophy department. But in the US, philosophy department um, also means mathematics sometimes. So to some degree, like mathematical logicists, they are sitting with the philosophers, OK? And similarly here, there's a big group working on causality. And this is also already, they have a long tradition already working it, on it already since the 90s. So they also have a quite interesting approach to this. I found a nice flow chart on this block down here. So which causal inference book should you read? So here the green boxes are basically many causal inference books, in particular the primer up here and the one from Jonas Peters that is over here. Also the one from Julia Pearl, the big one, and then some other ones from social sciences. And this is a flow chart that you could go through to find your book that is kind of matching, matching what you are interested in. Okay, but let's get started with correlation. So here's another one. I think I've seen this first time from Bernhard Schulkopf, but I guess it is from an older book from Professor Taubert and Professor Kuhl from Georg Thieme Verlag Stuttgart 1981. So it's already a classic, yeah. And it shows us now, so I translated, this is the number of births in Baden-Württemberg, okay, like southern Germany, and the number of stalks that they are in Baden-Württemberg. And you see like a really very nice negative correlation between the number of stalks and the number of births, right? Curious, 
So the fun thing, of course, is the storks bring the babies in some of the cultures, right? And this thing clearly proves that this is true, right? This is such an obvious connection. However, now you're already kind of tuned to, to think about this correctly. So there might be another variable. So maybe the number of storks and the number of births has nothing to do with each other, right? Um, but it is about industrialization and about the, uh, the size of families, that the families got smaller and smaller with industrialization and these kind of processes that they are here at play. And this is not a proof that the storks bring the babies, but it really looks like it, right? And the data is not faked or somehow tuned. So it's, it's really, those are like, I guess, so they collected here the right numbers. So actually maybe I should, should get this book and, and get the original. So, so what's going on here? What we often look at is the correlation between two variables, right? So this is a scatter plot of two variables. So this is one variable table where we have for each year, we have the number of births and for each year we have the number of stocks. So basically the data that is down here is like two columns in a big Excel sheet, right? Where every row is a year. And then we can ask, uh, now we would say, okay, each column is a random variable. So one is a random variable of the number of births. The other one is a random variable of the number of stocks. And we are interested in the correlation between the two. Okay. And that is then checking whether everything is nicely on a line. And the formula for this is that we calculate the covariance between the two variants and divide by the standard deviation. That's now to get numbers between minus one and plus one. Yeah, so already the covariance would tell us something, right? But to really distinguish between that they are all nicely on a line and that they are kind of all spread over, then it's nicer to normalize it. We can also empirically estimate it, of course, from data. So if we have such a sample where x1 to xn is now the first column of my Excel sheet and y1 to yn is the second column, then we can just use this formula here where the one over n is missing because it appears on top and on the bottom. So this is really just calculating something like the variance. Yeah. So you calculate the average distance to the mean, but you combine it with the average distance of the other random variable. And this is calculating the correlation. So correlation, what does it do? It measures similarity between curves, right? So if there are two curves that are very similar, um, in, in particular, let me draw an example on the board. Often we talk about correlation and we are looking at this kind of data, right? But there's another way to think about it. So suppose we would have like a curve of something that looks like that. For example, this is the number of times um, whatever a person clicks um, whatever soccer or world championship or something. World championship and then there's another curve yeah which which might have a different axis but it's kind of aligned and that might be the amount of water that is needed or something right the that is wasted or something then it could be that two lines are having from a totally different topic they are perfectly aligned and also for this situation you can compare basically by calculating a correlation between the two curves. Yeah, you could find out that those two curves are perfectly correlated because if one goes up, the other one goes down and so on and so forth. And as you know, when there's a world championship, people are sitting and watching TV and then at the same time, they go into toilet and then suddenly a lot of water is used always at the same time. Okay, so there might be a correlation between this. So the correlation is a way kind of to find like the, the, the slope between two variables, but it's also a way to measure similarity between curves, right? So if you have two curves and they could be very correlation, correlated. Um, like graphically, you could also view the first column of your Excel sheet as a vector and the second as a vector. And then correlation is basically measuring the inner product between those two vectors. Yeah, if you disregard removing the mean and all of this, the operation is basically an inner product between two vectors. So you are measuring angles between these data sets in a way. Um, this rho is also called a second order statistic, second order because we are we having here a degree up polynomial. Uh, we have a de we have a polynomial of a degree up to two since we are multiplying variables. So the x is multiplied with the y 
And that's why it's like a second order statistic. So the first order statistic is the mean. Okay, there's we just averaging stuff. And then the second order statistic is stuff where we also square something. Basically, the covariance matrix is a summary of all there is for the second order statistics. But there could be also a third order statistic and fourth order statistic. So those are the higher order moments. Um, another thing is this number rho, the correlation. Yeah, it views scatter plot through the lens of Gaussian. So basically, we are only interested kind of then in, in not into the actual shape of the data, but more whether we can like fit a straight line through it. So the data could also So the data could be really on a, on a straight line, but maybe the data is more looking like this. And then the straight line would be also the correlation that would explain how, how the first variable and the second one is related. And that is what I typically mean when I say we put on our Gaussian glasses, right? When you see your Gaussian, when you put on your Gaussian glasses, then this data set kind of blurs into a, a Gaussian distributed um, data set that has the same covariance as the one that we've seen here. Okay, and the correlation being a second order statistic is only looking at aspects that are kind of expressible by Gaussian distributions. Um, all these nice features do not imply causation. Okay, so that is a, like a very important statement. Um, however, sometimes correlation between two variables give us hints. Okay, so there might be a relation Sometimes it's obviously wrong, like with the storks and the number of births or with pirates and climate change, but sometimes it's not so clear. And in those cases, then we should investigate further. Um, there was a nice search engine. Unfortunately, it's not there anymore. It was called Google Correlate, okay? So you see from the logo up here that it's a bit older already. And here, what you could do is you could um, type in a search query, like the number of births in Germany, for example, and then search correlation, and it would try to find other data sets which are perfectly correlated. And that's a, like a fun project, right? So this is, this is like how, how to come up with these kind of plots which totally don't make sense and which are fun to look at because you get two curves which are perfectly correlated but which have nothing to do with each other, okay? Um, okay, so that was the formula I showed you already. Let's see how our brain is uh, doing correlation coefficients. So how good are we at it? So can we see it here? So or how good did we understand the formulas? So what would be the correlation coefficients here? Could you could you give a guess? So you could put it into the chat. So let's start with the left hand side. So what's the correlation coefficient of that one? Any guess? Yes, one is perfectly fine. What about the other one on the other side? It's minus one. What about the one in the middle? Perfect. So you're really good. Yes. So that's zero. And then any guesses for this one over here? So the second from the left. So what is it? Yeah, 0 0.7. Yeah. And so on. Very good. So this is exactly how it works, right? So if it likes going up, you have a positive correlation coefficient. If you have something circular symmetric, the correlation is zero. And if it's going down, yeah, then it's getting negative. So here are other ones. So what are the right numbers here? So we know already the outside that they are minus one and one. So what about the second from the left? So what is this one? What correlation coefficient? Any suggestions? One, okay. Is there, are there others so that did um, one? So you're all agreeing on one? So why do you think it's one? You can also put it into the chat or you can just speak up if you want to be in the video on YouTube. Someone says 0 0.8. Yes, I'm also not so sure what the right one is. Okay, I show you. It's always one and then minus one. So basically I could rescale the y-axis and then this image looks like that one, right? And as you know, the um, correlation coefficient is normalized. So the scaling, if you have an arbitrary scaling on a variable, it gets like canceled out by dividing by the standard deviation. Okay. So for that reason, it doesn't matter how you scale the y axis. And by rescaling the y axis, you can arbitrarily change this angle here, right? But you cannot really make it completely horizontal. You can only get it closer and closer to being horizontal. 
So down here in the middle, I didn't wrote anything because like, yeah, that's, I think it's a case where one variable is not varying at all. Okay, so that means the mean might be zero and all values are zero and I will get a division by zero if I divide by the standard deviation. So the standard deviation here is zero and so for that reason the correlation coefficient is not defined. Here are some more fun ones. So what about those? By the way, I, I, I got these um, plots all from the Wikipedia page. So there someone put it there and I think the license is you can do whatever you want with it. So that's why I have it here. But please check back on the Wikipedia page on correlation to, to get the right source. So what about those? What's the correlation coefficient between those ones? I mean, this is Gaussian, right? And Gaussian is, is a great distribution because it's like central limit theorem, right? So you know that if you have lots of effects add up, you get a Gaussian distribution. So it's great to know something about it. But sometimes there's not so much noise. Sometimes there's more structure in the scatter plot, right? And now what about your correlation coefficient? So what do you get out of these ones? So what do you think? So what about these two? Are they correlated or not? The ones, these four, four clusters, do you think they are correlated or not? Any intuition? So you can put it into the chat. Zero, not correlated. Oh, you are very good. Oh, you are very quick at going to Wikipedia. Um, they are all uncorrelated. Yeah, you're right. You're totally right. So, but it doesn't mean that there's no structure if they are uncorrelated, right? Up here, I would say there's no structure, right? So it's rotational invariant and yeah, somehow if I know one, if I know the horizontal axis, I don't know anything about the other. So that's this intuition, intuition about be, between independence and uncorrelatedness. Um, however, they are also all uncorrelated, but here they know a lot about each other. So suppose the center is zero and I know at the x axis I'm having uh, zero, uh, um, yeah, zero as well. Then I know suddenly that the y axis will be plus one or minus one. So it's very, there's a lot of information in here. So my x axis tells me a lot about the y, okay, because there's a particular shape. Similarly, if my value on the x axis is plus one, then for sure I know that the y is with a little bit of noise, it will be around zero, okay? So those are examples of data sets that are totally uncorrelated, but where the data is dependent on each other, okay? So there's the Gaussian world, which is up here, the world of PCA and so on and so forth. And then there's the non-Gaussian world and there's a lot of stuff happening, okay? So, uncorrelatedness does not imply statistical independence, okay? It could be even worse, yeah? So they could be uncorrelated, but X is the cause of Y, okay? So um, the bottom left one, this one here, kind of it makes more sense to say that the X axis is causing the value of the Y axis than the other way around. Why am I saying that? Because yeah, on the, on the um, y axis, if I have a, have a value, there are still four possibilities that the x could have, but the other way around, it's kind of a simpler model, oh, okay? But this causes here is like in, 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 uh, in uh, quotation marks, so it's also not really implying it, but, but there are these connections. So correlation measures similarity between curves, uh, curves, but correlation is not the same as statistical dependence. That only holds for Gaussian distribution. So in Gaussian distributions, if you are uncorrelated, then typically you're also independent. In particular, correlation does not imply causation. However, it gives us hints, okay? And then uncorrelatedness does not imply independence. That's the other way around. Um, so X and Y could be uncorrelated even though one is the cause of the other, okay? It's just about yeah, rescaling the axis and maybe rotating so that the overall covariance matrix gets the identity, then you're uncorrelated. Okay, now here's a different way to think about data, how data is generated. Data is typically generated by some mechanisms, okay? And I'm not defining you what a mechanism really is, but a mechan I, I give you an example. So a mechanism is, let's say, um, a thermometer is a mechanism of generating a number from a temperature, okay? So there's like some physical laws behind that are generating my data. So, and how can I describe mechanisms? So this is a little story here. So there are some 
Swedish scientists found out, or even more credible American scientists found out, or even more credible Russian scientists found out. So that there are studies that show that married people are happier. Okay. So interesting. Okay. Why not? Yeah, this, this could be found out in, in one of the, these, these newspapers that you have at the hair cutter, right? Sure. So there are different conclusions we can draw from this. So it could mean we should all get married, right? Because it makes us more happy, right? Right? Because married people are happier. However, it could also mean that no one wants to marry unhappy people, right? So it could mean that the people are already happy or not, and then some of them get married, some of them don't. There's a third option. There could be also a common cause, right? That we get happy and that we get married. Maybe there's a gene in our genome, in our DNA, which kind of implies that we are more likely to get married or to be a happy person, right? Or they could be like totally unrelated. That's another option. And the, the study was just bogus, okay? I mean, study sounds always very nice, but then you as scientists, you should look at the methods at the data and what did they exactly do, whether it really makes sense. So let's make it a little bit more formal, but only very mildly formal. Let's say M is a random variable, a binary random variable that just says being married and H being not uh, being happy. So now here are four different scenarios that describe these four possibilities, these four different conclusions. So the first sentence was, if you get married, you are more likely happy. That would be a statement which is true if M is causing H, okay? The second statement is true if H is causing M, okay? And then the third statement is there is a common cause C, which is causing both of them. And then there's the fourth one, which is that they're both independent. So now what we did is we translated these different statements now in, in more mathematical language kind of, right? We abstracted away. Here's another way. And those are now the graphs that Julian Pearl is using already for the Bayesian networks. But here we are using them for causal relationships as well. And that's also made and pioneered by Julia Pearl. So we can also draw these graphs where basically the error of the graph is the causal direction. And actually, when I recall right, how we introduced Bayesian networks with these, um, with these networks that the lawn was wet and there was rain or there was a sprinkler standing, we were drawing them and the story was causal kind of, right? The sprinkler was wettening the graph. So kind of intuitively we were doing it. Um, however, that wasn't completely necessary for the, for the thing, but it made it more intuitive. So, and so these four different situations, they can be also drawn as graphical models describing how the data is generated. But as you recall, when you have probabilities, right? You could have a joint probability of M comma H described by any fully connected graph, right? So you could describe it equally well by this one and by that one, right? So the joint probability distribution, as we will see two slides ahead, cannot distinguish these cases. Here's another one. We can also describe these scenarios as computer programs, okay? This is just another way to write the graph. So we could say there is a generator function F, which is sampling. It's throwing coins with a certain probability to get the random variable H, and then given the outcome, I sample the random variable to get the happiness variable, okay? Or the other way around, or I first generate a random variable for the common cause and so on. So this is just another way to write it down. Um, and let's try to write it down with probabilities. Unfortunately, in all these scenarios on the left-hand side, we have the joint distribution. And now the different situations, they are basically different factorings of my joint distribution, right? So I could have a probability distribution of M and then of H given M, okay? However, the rules of the pro probability calculus is not preventing us at all to say, okay, if this product is equal to the joint, this product is also equal to the joint. So some of probabilities are not really expressive enough. So if I have a joint distribution as a description of my two columns of my Excel sheet, then this description, the joint distribution, cannot express whether we have one is the cause of the other or the other way around, okay? It, it just is not able to represent it. On the other hand, a computer program could, or these graphs, they can, right? So the graphs are expressive enough to distinguish these different cases, okay? So that's the basic idea of causal reasoning. We have to come up with a graph, and once we have the graph, 
then we can derive the right formulas to do the calculations. We will keep it all a bit superficial. I just want to give you like the gist of it, right? So there's a lot more to say about it. But so basically the graphs are expressive enough to distinguish the situation. The probabilities are unfortunately not. So the joint distribution cannot distinguish these four cases, okay? So the graph or the computer programs, they really describe a mechanism, right? So I first sample the M and then I sample the H or I first sample a gene and then this gene will sample like the, the phenotype, whether it's married or happy, whether you are more likely to, to have any of these. So joint probabilities does not describe any of the mechanisms, but is just describing the outcome, the observed data at the end, okay? Good, in particularly, the joint distribution does not tell me what's happening if I set the M to a certain value. So let's say the M is a treatment and the H is whether you get cured or not, then of course I'm interested in if I give the treatment to a person or I don't give it, how does it causally influence the age? And unfortunately the joint distribution doesn't tell us anything about it, okay? But instead we, what we would need is a formalism to describe the mechanism. And that is what causal models um, are all about. Um, I won't go into much detail here yet, but um, the short story is that if we say a Bayesian network gets a different semantics now that an arrow is not just meaning that I'm conditioning on the variable, but it's really causing, one is causing the other, then these Bayesian networks can be used for causal modeling, okay? Um, Perl is developing from these graphs and also different notations for probability. So he's extending the notation of probabilities in the following way. So the starting point is what we have already. So the typical conditional distributions, that's already useful to ask questions like, what if I see A, yeah? What's the probability distribution of Y given that I have A? So that is something that I can answer with the joint distribution. However, there are other statements that I want to make, like interventional statements, and that's different now. So that's now saying, what if I do A? So if I set variable A to a particular value, and that's a completely different story. That's like making an experiment, um, randomly selecting several amount of people, and randomly some of them have to marry and some of them don't marry, but you randomly assign it. And then you will find out whether happiness really is caused by being married or not, okay? Or with the treatment. So you really want to put a certain treatment here, for example, taking vitamin C pills, and you can see whether this will lower the chances of you getting whatever, getting a flu or getting corona or whatever. If you do it randomly, assigning the people to the treatment, like taking vitamin C pills, then you get something out. So, so then you get the answer to this question of this do statement. However, if you only have observational data, so you hand out on the Christmas market like questionnaires to people, you're asking whether they have lots of flus and you're asking whether they are taking vitamin C pills, then you only get the joint distribution and then you don't know whether the vitamin C pills, even if they are super correlated with not getting flu, you don't know whether it's a cause. It could be that certain people um, who are often ill, yeah, they tend to take all kind of drugs just out of, um, because they believe that it works or something, even if it doesn't. So again, there could be a common cause. Curiously, there's also a third level here. And the third level are so-called counterfactual statements. And that's a bit more complicated. So that's basically saying um, a counterfactual statement is a statement counter to the fact. So it's a statement that is um, in, in contradiction to the data that I observed. So suppose I have observed that the random variable A has the value A prime, okay? However, now I'm interested what would have happened if I have chosen, if, if I would have done the other thing. So for a little story, suppose you have like a patient and he gets treatment A, or let's say he gets treatment A prime, yeah? And you get a certain outcome being cured or being not cured. Now a counterfactual statement would be, so what would have been the outcome if that particular patient would have gotten the other cure or the other treatment? Or another one is, um, yeah, there's this thing, there's this statement, um, yeah, if, 
it's it's like let's say you play poker okay you you might know this card game right where you bet money and what happens often you take these two cards in texas hold them you look at them and you fold immediately okay and now a counterfactual statement would be a statement like so what would i have won if i would have stayed in the game okay it's counter to the fact since you folded your card but it's interesting to discuss this okay to find a reason uh, to find a notation for this so and Julia Pearl's work is going through all these three levels. So he deals with observation statements, which is just conditioning. He deals with interventions, which is really like taking action, taking a policy. And he's also having a formalism, how to really properly mathematically define counterfactual statements. And um, all these threes are quite interesting and mind opening because typically we are up here. We are only, when we're doing deep learning, basically we're having a big data set and we're looking at the joint distribution, right? We are not manipulating anything. We are just trying to fit like the input to the output and that's it. But it's not about really doing an intervention. However, there's reinforcement learning, which you might know, where you, for example, let the computer play Atari games and the computer is playing around with different actions and the different actions, they are like do statements, okay? They're like really saying, okay, what happens if I go to the left or to the right? And just by trying it out, you're collecting data to get these kind of statements. Um, if you do planning, so let's say you're having a, a chess computer. The chess computer is also doing counterfactual statements, right? So the chess computer having a model of the game can build a, a whole search tree and then ask questions. So if I move this pawn, so what will be the result? So what will the, the opponent play? And this is like possibly counterfactual reasoning that is going on there. Yeah. So there are these different levels, but often we are just up here, in particular in machine learning. Most of the time we are up here when we think about these things. And I just want to show you with these slides, there are more levels. So there's more. And the interesting stuff begins here with the interventional statements, right? So we want to know, suppose you're a politician, and you want to know, so what will lower the corona rate? So what actions? Yeah, And that you cannot get from observational data very well. You get some hints, but you don't know for sure because there are so many variables. Good, here's another overview um, picture from the book from Peters, Janssing and Schulkopf. So there are the probabilistic models down here and you can think of it just as the joint distribution of some data set. And, um, from the joint distribution, you can have some probabilistic reasoning. So those are now just words, which will tell you something about future outcomes possibly, right? If you have a joint distribution and now you know you get new samples from the data set, then this distribution will tell you something about new observations and what will come out, okay? So reasoning is one direction and going from the data to the model, like learning parameters of a neural network and so on and so forth. This is typically called statistical learning or learning briefly. So, however, above the probabilistic model, there are the causal models and that's really something different and more fanciful, yeah? So here, a causal model will not only tell us something about observations, but also about interventions. So if I change like a certain variable in my network, yeah, then it will, the arrows in my Bayesian network will tell me what other variables are influenced and what others are not. Okay, so let's say you have um, the network up here and I'm manipulating the happiness variable by giving everyone thousand dollars or something, then if this is a true model, this won't change the number of people that are married, right? Because the error is going into the other direction. However, if that is the true model, yeah, then giving everyone thousand dollars of, I know it's a weird concept of happiness, but let's keep it uh, for a while. Then the causal model will imply that peop more people will get married, okay? So knowing the true causal model will tell me also what's happening when I intervene onto the model, okay? So it's super powerful if you can have a causal model. Um, in particular, you can even define something about counterfactuals, which is super fancy. The difficulty, of course, is how to get the causal model, right? I mean, getting a probabilistic model is like doing density estimation or doing PCA or doing whatever, learning a neural network, doing these things. So how do you get a causal model? That's typically much harder. And it's not part of 
these books often. So the parallel book often assumes that you are working together with a social scientist and the social scientist knows her variables and she knows, okay, I know income is causing that and that is causing that. So they can draw really a causal diagram for the variables since they have studies on that. And then having this causal model, um, you as the um, computer scientist could now say, okay, when you have this causal model, then you have to observe these variables and then you can infer the causal effect. So you are not coming up with the causal model from the data. However, there are methods recently also, and they are also mentioned in the Peters Janssing Schulkopf book, how to get from observations via causal learning to a causal model, okay? And of course, this is like the most exciting pathway here, yeah? taking lots of data that we are generating every day and then coming up from this with causal models. Actually, human learning, right? When you have a baby walking around or playing with their toys, they are doing observations. They are making also interventional experiments and they are trying to come up with a causal model, right? And they then learn after a while that if they take a bottle out of glass and they drop it onto the floor, it makes a really nice noise, okay? And it really sounds great. And the father will be screaming afterwards, okay? So there is a causal model of the world after a while. Often jokes and stuff that we talk about are using causal models, right? Something's happening that we don't expect, okay? And this not expecting or that we expect something else means that we have a causal model in our head of our world around us. In particular, many things are not only about correlation, but really about the mechanism, how the world works. Okay, so I think once you start with causality and you see it the first time, I hope you will never forget that there is something that we need to explore as scientists further. So there's a lot of work to do up here. Okay. This causal learning from here to here, from the data to the causal model is also called causal discovery. So let's look at some examples, okay? So now you're the learner. So there's a nice data set from the Tübingen people. So the authors of the book, they were all working together in Tübingen. And they looked at the following problem. Suppose you have two random variables and we look at the scatter plot. Can you infer which is the cause and what is the effect, right? It looks like an arbitrarily difficult question but curiously, they and also some other colleagues from other lab, they came up with some interesting methods that can do it. So by looking at this scatter plot, come up with an answer to the question. So is this the cause and that's the effect or the other way around? Okay, which is really surprising. And the key insight here is that these distributions are very non-Gaussian. So if the distribution is super Gaussian, uh, uh, not super Gaussian, if it is Gaussian, uh, super Gaussianity is something else. So if they are Gaussian, then all these methods fail. So they work in particular with the features that are non-Gaussian. The other cool insight is these methods, they depend on that the relationship between the variables should be non-linear. So those two things could be exploited, non-linearity and being non-Gaussian. And maybe if you recall the lecture on um, Gaussian distribution, I said Gaussian distributions is as a linear algebra of um, probability theory and exactly departing from this comfort zone of being linear and being Gaussian and going to the non-Gaussian world, then suddenly you can do things that people were not um, able to do before. So let me give you the answer here. So this is the data set. I think Dominic Janssen collected it. It's cities in Germany. Each point is a city in Germany and it's its altitude above the sea level and the average temperature, okay? So this thing here, I think is the Zugspitze, which is like the highest mountain in Germany. And of course the average temperature is quite low. And then some other things over here. I don't know, this bubble is probably Düsseldorf. I have no idea. Anyway, so there's a, clear correlation between the two. However, curiously, one is the cause and the other one is the effect, right? Let's think about it. Suppose you are um, um, you are at the beach, okay? So you're at sea level, so your altitude is very small. So maybe at Flensburg or somewhere or in Kiel. Yeah, and then you will have a certain temperature, great. Now let's build a really high tower, right? Which a building which is like a kilometer high. Will it change the average temperature of, of the place? 
Um, I think yes, yeah, of course. When you go up, up in the sky, I thought the other way around, no, but it will change the temperature. So the altitude is probably the cause of the temperature. Let's think it's the other way around. You are sitting at the beach and you are cooking noodles, okay, like on a cooker. You are increasing the temperature, but your altitude is not changing at all, okay? So this is an example where the altitude is the cause and the temperature is the effect. And actually, this is also one of the data sets where some of the methods can predict that this is the case just by looking at the scatter plot. Here's another one. And again, you could wonder, so which is which? Um, it's very hard to look at it and to decide by uh, without looking at the axis. So let's look at the axis, what it is. It is always X axis implies Y axis, by the way. So this is the age of a person and this is the wage per hour. So the amount of money you make per hour, okay? It looks like when you're young, you don't get so much money, like in the middle ages, you get the most of the money. And then when you get older, the money goes down again. But that could be also just mean that um, uh, older people have older contracts and that's why they get fewer money. So there, you see there are always lots of tricky things. What you can also observe is this is very non-Gaussian, right? I mean, this is like clipped off at zero over here. The From left to right, it looks a bit Gaussian, but then up and down, it's not very Gaussian. In particular, here, a couple of outliers. And these properties of these distributions can be used to infer which direction is which. Here's another one. So it's horsepower of a car against miles per hour, okay? And then increasing the speed of the car doesn't mean it has more horsepower. So there's it's not a direct relationship. And another one, acceleration and horsepower. And another one, what is that one? Oh, that's the day and the temperature. Yeah, so it's going from one to 365 across the year. This are the temperatures. So of course, here, the different days are, of course, causing the temperature, not the other way around. Okay, and it's an interesting puzzle to come up with a computer program, which now exploits the higher order statistics of these scatter plots, and then trying to learn or coming up with a method that is implying, that will come up with day implies temperature and not the other way around. Good. You can download the data sets, by the way, if you want to play around with. And some of the methods are explained in this book, Elements of, whoops, what is that? Elements of Causal Inference, okay? So, of course, important is here to distinguish these two cases. Are you going from the data to the model or from the model to the data, okay? So that's an important thing to distinguish anyway. Sometimes um, people call going from the model to conclusions, inference, or reasoning, and going from the data to a model, people often call it learning or discovery, okay? This is again, I showed you already before. Okay, so far so good. Um, however, this is a machine learning class and there was a really nice paper, I think from Schulkopf et al. Maybe I, sh I should put it into the slides. I will put it into the slides after the lecture. Um, and this is also a chapter in the book from um, Peters et al on causal versus anti-causal learning. Well, learning here now really means machine learning, okay? And now what do I mean by causal and anti-causal learning? Um, so let's look at MNIST, our most, um, uh, most used data set. So MNIST, so those are just sketches that I made. Um, so the MNIST data sets has two pieces. So I have handwritten digits. So that is the left-hand side over here. We typically call it X, okay? Little X coming from a set of digits, capital X. And then there's the label, which I'm using this American way of writing a one. So suppose we only have the label zero and one yeah, for a subset of the MNIST. And that is typically a little Y in Y. And this thing is some vector R to the D, and this is just from a discrete set. Now, when we do digit recognition, what we are doing is we are learning a function from X to Y, okay? Now, the question is, are we learning the causal direction? Uh, are we learning the anti-causal direction? Yeah, that's a curious question to ask, right? So we know there's a joint distribution of X and Y, but is one the cause of the other? Okay, or the other way around, or maybe none of them. So let's um, try to understand here the two different ways to think about MNIST. So first of all, let me try to explain what is the causal direction. So the causal direction in MNIST is that given a label, generate an image. So why is that the causal direction? Because I think of a number, okay, I think of the number 10, uh, 10 is not good, I think of the number 0, and then I draw a 0. 
So here's the mechanism, right? I'm having the thought and then I'm generating the zero. Okay, so writing is the causal direction. So factorizing my joint distribution in the causal direction would be I first generate a label and then given the label, I generate an image. And now what about this P of X given Y? This distribution is basically a distribution that tells me how to write. Okay, so I'm learning the writing mechanism here when I can describe P of X given Y. And for the writing mechanism, the frequencies of my different letters in my alphabet or the different digits are irrelevant. Yeah, so if I can write all these digits and I learn them, yeah, it doesn't matter somehow what digits now I write. So I'm totally fine with writing all of these several times and not the other ones. So this is also forward in time. So this is also giving us a hint that this is the causal direction. Okay, so somehow first we have the thought, then we write something down. Let's study the anti-causal direction. So the factorization goes the other way around. And in a way, now the P of Y given X is learning to read. Okay, so one is writing, the other one is reading. And for this one, the frequencies are relevant. Yeah, so suppose I'm, um, um, let's say I'm, I'm writing, I'm writing letters, yeah, not only digits, but letters. And I'm having a really weird way of writing stuff up, yeah, whatever. So what is this? Um, I'm not sure whether you can read it. So, so I really tried to have like a messy handwriting here, but how would we read it? Of course, we would use our context information. So the most likely one of this one is probably an age. And then there's the next likely one is this is an A and that is a P and a P and then a Y. So we are using the distributions of these letters. This thing could have been maybe also an M, maybe, but Hem I is not very likely. Okay, so in this context, maybe there's a certain distribution. Similarly, when you play Scrabble, right, you know, Scrabble this with these letters, these wooden, wooden letters, and then you have, let's say, the letter E. And then when you look on the German version, you will get some points, maybe one, okay, for the letter E. But in a different language, maybe you get a two, or maybe even three. And what are these numbers here? These numbers are the number of points that you gain when you form a word. That means if you have a letter, which is very unusual, you get lots of points. So in a way, these numbers are like the inverse probabilities that the that this letter appears in the language. Now, when you compare the German version of Scrabble and the English version of Scrabble, then these numbers are different, okay? So in the English language, the letters have a different distribution. That means if I'm an English speaking person, I might read this in a different way than if I'm a German person speaking because my probabilities over the different letters is different, okay? So what I'm saying is, Suppose you are training um, a neural network reading letters of German text, yeah? then it might fail on English text because the distribution of the letters is different. So somehow in the P of Y given X, the P of Y plays a role, right? So if in doubt, if both of them get the same scores, we might take the one that is the one that is more likely in the language that I'm looking at, okay? So the frequencies are really relevant for this. Um, in a way, this goes backwards in time, right? I'm looking at the image and I want to get back to the thought. So here I was trying to draw pictures for the different distributions. So suppose my P of Y is the distribution of having a zero or one, and I just draw these column plots here. Those are the frequencies, okay? And then I have the probability of X given Y being equal to one and another distribution of x given y equal to zero. So suppose now I'm having here a one dimensional space for my images. Yeah, so this is actually like this 2D or this not 2D, 784 dimensional space of hand drawn digits. I will have some cluster for the y equal to one and another cluster for the y equal to zero. Okay, 
So in a way, the P of Y is describing the frequencies of my letters and the P of X given Y is describing how to draw the digits. For the anti-causal direction, I can also try to write the P of X and the P of Y given X. However, now the P of X is now a distribution which has like two bumps, okay? So it looks a bit more complicated. I have a bump here around the digits that look like a one, and then I have a bump at the digits that look like a zero, okay? And then I have a P of Y given X. So this distribution is a bit more hard to draw, but I'm, I'm using the same axis here as up here since I'm conditioning on the X. So depending on where I am on the axis, I'm believing I'm seeing a one or I'm seeing a zero, okay? So now, curiously, those are two different descriptions of my joint distribution, right? So my P of X comma Y, I could either store a P of Y frequencies and how to draw images, or I do it the other way around. And curiously, but this is now not really like a formal proof of something, I find this description much simpler, right? So this is like a mixture of Gaussian type of thing. And this thing is more complicated. This is like having like a, a multi, multimodal distribution, which I then split like Voronoi cells into different compartments. So in a way, there's an asymmetry between here. However, I'm putting under the carpet a little bit, there's also an asymmetry between the variables, right? The X is a continuous one and the Y is a discrete one. So maybe one should look at more examples really to, to undercover this, but this looks like the more simple description. Anyway, here's a nice figure copied from the book from uh, Peters et al, giving an example of learning the causal direction, which is the top one and learning the anti-causal direction. So this is now a bit more written, spelled out a causal model of X is the cause and Y is the effect. There are some additional noise variables here that are typically added. And then there's a true causal direction here. And we are trying to learn um, going, so this is the green arrow is the true causal connection and we are learning in the causal direction. So what does it have to do with the left-hand side? So this is supposed to be messenger RNA, this thing down here, yeah? And that gets translated by some ribosome into these um, amino acid stuff, right? To generate like a complicated protein. I'm not at all an expert of this, but this is a typical forward model where I'm mapping a messenger RNA to a protein, okay? And so um, these, these methods like alpha fold, for example, the, these protein folding things are examples of causal learning where I'm learning the causal direction. So this is the cause and the protein is the effect that comes out of the machine here. And actually this is a mechanism. It's really translating one random variable into another random variable here. And so the top one in bioinformatics would be an example of causal learning. The digit recognition is an example of anti-causal learning because the image has been produced by a writer, how he writes it here, and we are kind of reading it the other way around. Okay, so far so good. Um, so we can talk about the true causal model, which is here C going to E, like cause to effect. And then we can say, what does it mean? Learning the causal direction now means going the same direction that is approximately learning to write or learning to create something. Yeah? And the anti-causal direction is something like learning to read yeah? or learning to interpret something that is already existing. Okay, so those are just two possible definitions. <clears throat> okay, now, this is all I wanted to say so far about causal and anti-causal learning, just to say there is a joint distribution typically that we apply deep learning or some other method to. However, we could sometimes think of the causal direction. We cannot always do that, but sometimes we can do. And when we can do it, we can ask whether we are learning the causal direction or whether we are learning the anti-causal direction. Okay, now what deeper insights does it give us for machine learning? That's the next thing. So there's semi-supervised learning. And the curious thing is semi-supervised learning works in one of them, but not in the other one, okay? And then there's so-called covariate shift and there it's the other way around. So this distinction between causal and anti-causal learning is giving us a deep insight into semi-supervised learning. Let's first 
let me explain you what semi-supervised learning is. So suppose we have a regression task, right? So we have pairs x, y that coming from a joint distribution and the regression task is given x predicts a y. Okay, so that's it. Typically we write it down with an L2 law. So we have an expectation of some function f of x minus y. We want to minimize that one. Okay, it could be also spelled out like this. And there is a minimization. So the F could be a particularly trained neural network, or it could be just a linear regression with some basis function. It could be a support vector regression, whatever. Um, we can also write this, uh, this result here as the, that the optimal regression function is typically the conditional expectation. Okay, so that's a deeper result from statistics. So there is this so-called conditional expectation and that is the best solution typically here. Now, curiously, um, it only depends on P of Y given X. So the solution for the regression task here does not depend on P of X, but only on P of Y given X. So even though we have the joint distribution, all we care for when we do the regression in the supervised manner here is P of Y given X. Okay, so that's all we need to have. So, this is what we're minimizing. This is the best minimizer and that can be expressed with the conditional distribution in one direction. So now in supervised learning, we are given lots of labeled data. So we are having input output pairs. In semi-supervised learning, we have additionally to this data set, a lot of unlabeled data. So we have a lot of examples of P of X, okay? Ideally now is that the information about P of X is somehow telling us also something about P of Y given X, okay? And this is now a statement that is beyond stuff that we talked about before. So how can P of X tell us something about P of Y given X? So how can this be? So certain assumptions, there we can do it. So suppose we have two data points already seen, a, a positive and a negative, so we would draw this line. But let's say now, additionally, I tell you, here are lots of gray data points that look like this, like two moons, yeah? Then this is now a data set for semi-supervised learning. So we have two data points which are labeled and we have lots of unlabeled data points. Now, how can you use it to get a better classifier, right? If you don't use it, your classifier will be just this straight line up here. If you use it, you would say, Okay, it looks like there are two clusters of data points. So there's one cluster over here and there's another one over there. And so even if I don't know that those are all getting the white label, I think they get the white label because they are close to the, to the white data point, okay? And similarly up here. So you see that in some situations, like additional samples from P of X are telling us something about P of Y given X. So this can be made more specific when it works. So there's a so-called cluster assumption. So the cluster assumption is that if I have more samples from my P of X, yeah, they can be clustered and points in the same cluster will have the same label. Okay, so this is an additional assumption on my joint distribution. Here's another one, low density separation assumption. So that basically means that the true boundary of my classification problem is in an area where the P of X is small. Let's look back at the image. That's exactly what's happening here. So this is the true boundary where I would say my, my neural network spits out a 0 0.5. And that is basically where the P of X is very small, where I rarely see any data, okay? So the second, the low density separation assumption is very much related to the cluster assumption, okay? And here's the third one, the so-called semi-supervised smoothness assumption. That's another one. And it says something more technical that the conditional mean here, so viewing the conditional expectation as a function of the condition here, that this is a smooth function where P of X is large. So in other words, that means my P of X is large where I'm having here a lot of these gray points here. Yeah, and the smoothness means that the decision boundary is not suddenly changing when I go in this high density area. So where I'm having lots of gray points, yeah, there the decision is not changing arbitrarily, but it's smooth, it's a smooth function. So it's only slowly changing. So those are three typical assumptions. All these three assumptions could be now formulated with causality by saying that the distribution of P of X 
and p of y given x, they should be somehow depend on each other. So there should be a relationship between the two. Okay? They are kind of nicely tuned on each other. So now let's see what's happening if we learn the causal direction. So suppose one is the cause, the other one is the effect. Then in principle, the generating mechanism for x is independent of the generating mechanism of p of y given x. And in that case, semi-supervised learning will not work. Okay? So in that case, I can change the input distribution um, for my Scrabble letters or something, and but the, the mechanism of generating images is still the same. So if I learn to write digits or something, yeah, it won't help me to get more examples from the distribution. However, if I learn the anti-causal direction, then suddenly the P of X might really contain information about the P of Y given X, right? Because I could cluster the data of X, which basically means I do unsupervised learning on my point cloud P of X and I'm inventing clusters. And if these clusters are somehow related to my P of Y given X, then additional data from P of X is helping me, okay? And that is exactly um, the situation where I'm learning the anti-causal direction. And the authors wrote also a paper on this, and I'm not going into detail here, but they basically compared um, learning causal data sets and anti-causal data sets. So they did some semi-supervised learning for data sets where they know the relationship that they are trying to learn is anti-causal. Those are the big dots here. Yeah. And then they had some of them which are stars, where they know for sure that they are like an anti-causal, that they are learning the causal relationship. And then they compared whether adding the non-labeled data improved the um, learning or not. And they found out that the relative decrease of error yeah, was largest for the anti-causal ones. Okay? So the blue dots are mainly up here. Yeah? And that means that kind of their intuition with causal and anti-causal learning about semi-supervised learning is true. Let's look at the dual subject. And that's curiously covariate shift. Maybe you never heard this covariate. So covariate is like one of these fun words that you see in statistics papers. So if this is the input and this is the output of a function, often this X has many different names depending on the community. So all these are possible names that could be used. So the X could be a feature in machine learning or just the input, but sometimes it's also called the covariate or the regressor or the predictor variable or the independent variable and so on and so forth. Similarly, for the Y, they are different names, and they are all different names, okay? So, in particular, this means covariate here is relating to the input of our neural network, for example. So, covariate shift, what does it mean? It means a shift in distributions. So, basically, I'm having a regression task, for example, and I'm having a training set that comes from a certain joint distribution. And now a covariate shift means that the distribution changes for the test time, okay? And now the question is, can I still apply my learned neural network or not? Again, this is a regression task. I train on a P of X comma Y. And now I'm saying I want to evaluate my function F that I trained on a different distribution. So why does it make sense? Suppose you collected the data in one hospital and now you want to apply the learned neural network in a different hospital or in a different setup, or you trained on data from one country and you want to transfer it to another country. So the question is, in what situations is am I prepared for covariate shift and in what situations do I have to be careful? Again, we distinguish between learning the causal direction and the anti-causal direction. So suppose I'm trying to um, find the effect given the cause. So I'm learning the causal direction. Yeah. In this case, P of X and P of Y given X are independent mechanisms. So the choice here of my Scrabble distribution has nothing to do with how the letters look like. Okay, So I can arbitrarily change the language and then I have a different distribution over the letters. It doesn't change the P of Y given X. They are really independent. And that is really different from the anti-causal relation that we just seen in Sweetme supervised learning, where in principle I just take P of X, I cluster it and I get the labels back. Okay, so if that is the causal direction, and the typical assumption in these causal um, thoughts is that they are independent mechanisms. Um, 
Now, curiously, that means if my neural network learns p of y given x, I can also apply it to a different p of x. So in particular, I can replace it with a q of x and the result should be fine, okay? So if I learn to learn the, to read a letter, um, given a picture of a letter, yeah, if I really learn such a network here, then, um, Ah, only for the causal direction. No, okay, that was the wrong example. So suppose I trained my artificial ribosome, so my protein folding mechanism. Suppose I trained a neural network that takes a messenger RNA and then it spits out the protein in the right 3D structure or something. And I have a certain training set of messenger RNA where I'm doing this, then the result should be also applicable where I now have a different distribution of messenger RNA and it should spit out the right molecules, okay, ideally. So in the anti-causal anti direction, unfortunately, the P of X might contain information about the P of Y given X. And that means if I change the distribution, yeah, then that doesn't work anymore. So now I can come with the MNIST example. So the MNIST example is learning the anti-causal direction and for the anti-causal direction, unfortunately, I'm using the distribution of the different letters. So if in my data set, all the 10 digits had the same probability of appearing, yeah, but now in my test data set, I'm looking at numbers from questionnaires that might follow Benford's law or something, which basically says that some digits are much more likely than other digits, then possibly the performance is worse, okay? Because I change the input distribution of the labels. Good, there's also now a little example here. I'm not sure, yeah, let's, let's quickly go for it. So this is the causal model. So suppose I flip a coin, so that's the cause. And then the effect is basically now sampling from a Gaussian distribution, which I'm shifting either by the one or by the zero. So the outcome will be, the distribution of the X will have these two bumps, okay? And they are, have the same height. And you could view it also like, this is like sampling which digit do I want to draw? And then the Gaussian distribution is here a possible drawn digit. And let's say the space is so simple that I get the other drawing just by shifting the Gaussian distribution, okay? So P of X is just a mixture of two Gaussians. That's exactly what it is. Now, if I learn to read, so to go back from the X to the Y, I would find the boundary to be exactly right in the middle between those two bumps, right? So if I'm seeing an, an image X being on the left-hand side of the straight line here, I would say Y was zero. If it's on the other side, I would say Y is equal to one. Now, what's happening if I'm changing my test distribution in such a way that suddenly, um, I have lots of zeros, so the probability of seeing a zero is 0 0.9, and I have only very, very little ones, okay? What will happen is that the boundary will be shifted to one of the clusters, right? Because one of the clusters is really high, the other one is really low, and this will shift my boundary towards a smaller cluster, okay? So I will more often say it is the more likely digit, okay? So that is like a, a toy example which shows you that if I have a function that is kind of predicting into the anti-causal direction, yeah, then I cannot change the input distribution without making more mistakes. So we see that when we learn the anti-causal direction, covariate shift will destroy our results, okay? This is in particular bad. Suppose you, you're having like a trained, um, yeah, let's say you have some data from one hospital and um, there are certain illnesses with certain distributions and you kind of want to program like an, an assistant that helps with diagnosing, okay? But this diagnosing assistant is tuned on the probabilities that these different illnesses have. When you now go to a different country and you want to apply it, where the distribution of illnesses is totally different, it can happen that the performance is really bad, okay? Because um, in the anti-causal direction, unfortunately, you are not robust against covariate shift, okay? So that is really a big issue. Good, so far so good. Um, let me get to the summary. So the summary is basically now missing the causal stuff. I hope I kind of whetted your appetite to read more on about causality, maybe to do a little bit of exploration yourself into the books. 
from a machine learning perspective, the curious insight here is that we can now distinguish between learning the causal direction and learning the anti-causal direction. And curiously, this insight is giving us additional hints whether semi-supervised learning is working and whether we are robust against covariate shift. In particular, in if we learn the causal direction, we are robust against covariate shift, but semi-supervised learning is not helping at all. On the other hand, if we're learning the anti-causal direction, suddenly semi-supervised learning will give us a big gain in performance, but covariate shift is now problematic. Yeah, So somehow we are not robust against covariate shifts. Okay, so that's it for me. This is like was an eye opener that like these notions of causality are giving us now new hints of what methods work on data and what don't work. Okay, and how did we get this just by starting to think how was the data generated? Was it generated in the causal direction or the other way around? Okay, that's it for today. Thanks for your attention. I stopped the recording here, but I'm still open for questions.